Hey everybody, welcome all of our campuses, all of you watching online, all of you here at the 9.30 service because the Cowboys are playing at 12. I <laughs> see, hey, they're undefeated, so watch it. This year is the year, I'm telling you, mark, mark this, mark this, this year is the year for something. I don't know what, but for something. Hey, uh, $520,000 last week for Project Rescue. Can you, man, so grateful. So that's, that's what, that's coming so far. So man, I just wanna say to all of our campuses, thank you, thank you. That's, I think that's the largest uh, like mission offering we've ever received. I'm not positive, but uh, it's one of them. So thank you for being so generous. Um, hey, listen, we're starting a new series Today, the Bible for regular people. We're gonna be in the book of Colossians for four weeks. And along with this uh, series, we've got a YouVersion plan, hopefellowship.net slash YouVersion. And you can either go to YouVersion if you haven't already and, and, and search Hope Fellowship and look for the Bible for regular people. It looks like this. Or go to hopefellowship.net slash YouVersion. And listen, what's there? We have five devotionals. Here's my, here's my thought. Um, I would say do five devotionals this week and then start again the next week, do the same ones, and the next week, same ones, and the next week, same ones. Because every time you hear, you read, uh, there's a video there for prayer, there's uh, scripture, there's a devotion, all those things. And, and, and I just encourage you to do it every week, five days. You can do it however you want to, but it's available there as we walk through uh, the book of Colossians. Now, let me give you a little background. Paul wrote this book from his first imprisonment in Rome. And it was about 62 AD, 60 to 62 AD. He probably wrote this book along with Ephesians and maybe even Galatians. Uh, they were in the same province, modern day Turkey, that Asia Minor area. And um, Colossae was a city that Paul had never uh, at least been to to preach or teach. And um, he, this church started because a guy named Epaphras uh, heard Paul speaking somewhere, probably Ephesus, and went back to his city or his town and started a fellowship, started a church. And Paul writes this letter when Epaphras is visiting him in Rome. And, and Paul just says, hey, wait, before you go back, let me send you uh, some thoughts. That to read to the, the congregation. And so Epaphras waits, Paul writes the letter, uh, Epaphras takes it back to the church in Colossae and reads it, and they're, they're blessed. And, I, and I'm telling you what, this book is really, as, as all of them are, right? Uh, it's so good, and I invite you to, to go to that devotional, to, to read with us however you want to. There's gonna be four weeks, it's like a, uh, not a 30,000 foot view, but maybe like a 10,000 foot view. Uh, today is really in depth. We're gonna be in, in chapter one, but in, in, in this script, let me just tell you where we're going actually in this series, all four weeks. Today, we're gonna talk about reconciled. Next week, we're gonna talk about rules. Don't miss that one. Week three, we're gonna talk about renewed. And then week four, we're gonna talk about responses. These are, this is kind of just divided into four chapters today reconciled. Man, this is so good today. I promise you, so good. The, the most Christological passage, I think, in the whole New Testament is found in Coloss Colossians chapter 1. In verse 15, here's how Paul starts in the, in the first chapter. This is what Paul says about Jesus, and I want you to picture yourself. In the first century, in the city of Colossae, which is, you know, uh, not very old. So, so Jesus, 33 AD or so, ascended to heaven. This is 60 or 62. The church in Jerusalem starts, works its way up to Antioch and, and Syria. And then maybe uh, years later, it gets to Asia Minor. Some people are traveling, disciples, whatever, Paul. So understand that this church is not very old. You and I have had a, a lot of time. Is, there's so many studies that you can do on Right Now Media. There's so many Bible references. There's so much help that we have to understand Scripture. Well, I want you to picture yourself in first century. 
you're trying to wrap your mind if you're Jewish, you're trying to wrap your mind if you're Gentile, in other words, pagan, in other words, worshiped many gods, and that's the way you were raised, that there were many, many gods, and it doesn't matter, you know, we're all in, the, in this together, so whatever you want to worship. I want you to picture yourself hearing these words from Paul so that you can better understand who Jesus is and what he has done. You and I have read this before probably, but I want you to just kind of picture yourself in first century. You don't know much. Here's what Paul says about Jesus, verse 15 of, of chapter one. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Everything that we heard Jesus say, everything that we saw Jesus do, that's God. Every teaching, every attitude, every action, that's God. He is the visible image in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. He is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything else was created. So this is not just like Jesus appeared on the scene in the first century, somehow, some way, and became God-like while he was here. No, no, no. He has always existed. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything. So it wasn't just by himself. Through Jesus, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on the earth. He made the things that we cannot see and the things that we can't, the things we can't see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else. So picture you're hearing this and you're wondering this, this, this so-called Messiah out of, out of Israel, out of Beth, uh, Bethlehem, out of uh, you know, Jerusalem, and, and you heard it, he died, but then he kind of rose in, from the dead, and you're just like, okay, well, wow, uh, I see these changed lives, I see these people loving like I've never seen before, and then, then they, they're getting this, this, this letter from the apostle, Paul, who by this time is pretty famous, no, well, should I say, I, that's a, probably a bad word. He is, he is well known in the Christian community. Even if he had not been there, he is well known for his letters, for his missionary journeys, uh, for his teaching, for his miracles that, that, that God did through him. Okay, so, so, so they're hearing this and they're going, oh, okay. So, so Jesus, this is not just a man who did a few miracles and then rose from the dead. This is the visible image of God. He is a part. So what Paul is doing is setting up the Godhead, helping us understand that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that Jesus is not just dropped in all of a sudden in first century. He always was, is, and will be. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness, in all his fullness, there's nothing that Jesus did not represent God. There's nothing that, that was missing when he represented God, was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and your actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. In other words, this 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 understanding of how we're made right with God. If there were usually the way a church started in the New Testament was a Jewish synagogue, a disciple, or someone from that heard a disciple would come to a Jew Jewish synagogue. That's where they'd kind of start and, and just say, hey, because they're mostly Jews. And, and this is the, the story of Jesus. This is the, 
This is what happened in Jerusalem. This is who he is. And then, then Gentiles would come in and, and they would understand. So understand that, that there were, he was laying out the foundation there. How we're made right with God is no longer the law. That's the old covenant. This is the new covenant. covenant. We are made blameless through what Jesus did. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world. And I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. This is one of the most powerful Christological, in other words, Christ um, uh, 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 representing or Christ teaching in the whole scripture. We sang this song, uh, everything bows at his name. Every, I mean, when you get to that, can I just tell you that, that there, there's more to it than just, oh, that's a good song. You know what I'm saying? That, that, man, that girl can sing. Man, guys, can I just tell you? Let me just stop for just a second. Time out. Worship, worship is more than a spectator sport. Yeah. Worship is more than just looking around and like, oh, this is good. This coffee is pretty good today. You know, I'm not against coffee. We're out in the, in the auditorium. I get, you know, we used to get blasted for that. Not anymore. But but can I just tell you that when we come to, to, to lines like that, everything bows at his name. And I just encourage you to lift up your holy hands and give him for worship and just say, you know what? I'm choosing right now in the middle of this song, I am going to put down my coffee. I'm going to put down my distractions and I'm going to worship you. I'm going to worship you and sing to you. That's if you, if you know Jesus, you'll do that. If you don't sit there. All right. So how's that for... <laughs> for mean. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so uh, this is who Jesus is. This is who Jesus is. And so as a result of who Jesus is, okay, so 15, verse 15 through whatever we just read, just going through, going through, going through. This is who Jesus is. He's supreme. He is God. He is the visible. Okay. All that. As a result of who Jesus is, and what Jesus did, as a result of verses 15 through 23, or whatever it was, 24, as a result of that, this is what happens to our lives. This is what rec reconciled means. That what G who Jesus is, what he did, that's reconciliation. He, we're not reconciled because of our good works, because of our money, because of our talent, because of our law keeping or rule keeping. We are made right with God because of who Jesus is and what Jesus did. And when we believe in him, we are made blameless, like, just as if we had never sinned. Just, there's so much theological things just in this, these, these little verses, just as if you had never sinned. We are made right with God. Now, as a result of that reconciliation, Here's what happens. I got five of them, so I got to hurry. Number one, number one, we have purposeful identity. I'm going to go back up to verse one of Colossians one, and, and let's talk about Paul just for a second. Verse one, Colossians one says this. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. Before Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ, he was a Pharisee. He was a Jewish Pharisee, which is the most conservative branch of the Jewish faith. Yet a more, uh, um, a more uh, liberal, maybe what we could call branch, which was the Sadducees. And then you had the more conservative branch was the Pharisees. Paul was a conservative uh, Pharisee. But when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, he became, his identity completely changed. It's as if we could say, this is a letter from Jack chosen by the will of God to be a school teacher for Jesus Christ. So it, whatever, whatever your name is, uh, Jill or, or Jane or Susie or Lucy, or uh, that's a good name, <laughs> Lucy's my granddaughter, uh, or Milo, that's a good name, my grandson, okay, Crosby, Junie, all right, so Whatever your name is and whatever you do, chosen, listen, chosen by the will, John, chosen by the will of God to be the pastor of Hope Fellowship. Uh, whatever your name is, chosen by the will of God to be an attorney for Jesus Christ, to be a doctor for Jesus Christ, to be a, a, a business owner for Jesus Christ, to be a, a real estate uh, developer for, for Jesus Christ, to be a whatever, football player. 
to be a baseball player, to be whatever. Chosen by the will of God. Our identity is no longer my will, it's no longer my way, it's no longer what I wanna be, what I wanna do. We, when we meet Jesus, when we are reconciled to the Father through who Jesus is and what he did, we have a new identity that is purposeful. There is a, a, there is a direction to what we're doing. It is not linear. It is not like, oh, well, I'll just kinda hopefully make it through and retire well. No, there is a purpose to our identity. The reason you're a doctor or, or an attorney or a pastor or a uh, business owner or a mother or a father, the reason that you do what you do is because you were appointed by God to be a light to where you are. That's our identity. That's everything we are. Second Corinthians 5 says that, that that means that anyone who belongs to Christ, what he has done, who he is, has become a new person. The old is gone. Your way, your sin, of course, but your way, my way, it's gone. A new life has begun. That's ident our identity is purposeful. That's what happens when we're reconciled to the Father. That's, 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 <laughs> this is chapter one. This is crazy. Okay, number two, number two. Um, we have love for God's people. Now, I'm not gonna stay on this long because I've been harping on this for a long time. But you noticed how many times in the New Testament, in, in the last few months, that we have read something like this. We have love for God's people. Colossians chapter one, verse three says it like this. We always pray for you and we give thanks to God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Jesus and your love for all of God's people. Um, this is, I mean, listen, you know I've said it over and over. The, the world will know that we are believers, that we are his disciples because we love one another. If we can love one another well, we have a chance of reaching this world. If we stay divided, if we stay like, um, you know, whatever the weird with other, uh, you know, I, I, listen, we don't all have to agree theologically. We don't all have to agree politically. We don't all have to agree on every little thing. But one thing we have to agree on is that we love each other. Now, I may not like you, but I have to love you. Does that make sense? I mean, we, I mean, we have to we'll overlook those faults. Make allowances for faults. Romans chapter 12. Paul, again, says it like this. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. Over and over over the last few weeks, because we are in a pivotal year, I understand it. We're in an election year. It's, it's very, the emotions run high, like 2020, not as, not as much, I feel, but, but it's there. I mean, it is there. You can feel it. You can see it on social media. You can see it on the news. You can see it. I mean, it's, it's always this way, but it seems a little more, it, it's infiltrated into the church division, so to speak. And all I'm saying is, uh, 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 those things are not, not important. They are important. The direction of our country is very important. You should be praying how you're going to vote. You should be praying about how you're going to be involved. You should be going to the word and you vote according to the word, not according to your likes. Amen. We have vote. Okay. So that's what I'll say about that. But having said that, having said that, what we do is we love each other. Well, not just pretend not just come to church and go, hey, 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 whatever, and then during the week, post what we want to post. Okay, I'll stop there. Stop there. Loving each other. Loving each other. Number three, we have confident hope. Now, this is the one. Okay. I am so sorry, Hope Fellowship, that I am not a preacher. There are times in which I want to be, not many, because I can't take that for a long period of time, I'm a teacher, okay? I'm not a preacher. This is one of the points. If I just knew how to, if I just knew I had a preacher on staff, I would have them come up and preach this point. We have, I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. We have, I'll, I'll explain in a minute. We have confident hope. Let's go to Colossians chapter one, verse four. We, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all God's people, which has come from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. When we choose to put our hope, our trust in the Lord, there, there, is, there is an understanding as believers that we have that no matter what happens down here, there is a confident hope. There is something ahead that this life is not all there is. 
that this difficulty, this chaos, these challenges, they're not all, this cancer, this is not all there is. There is a hope reserved, no matter what the circumstances look like. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, but those who hope in the Lord or trust in the Lord will renew their strength. If we trust in the government, you will be disappointed. If you trust in the Dallas Cowboys, you will be disappointed. I'm not saying that as a slam, I'm a fan. When you trust in the Rangers or the Stars or the FC Dallas or you, whatever, right? You trust in your college, you trust in your money, you trust in your degree, you trust in anything but Jesus, we will be disappointed. But when we put our trust in him, we renew our strength. Soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. This is where I wish I was like, my God. You know, this is where I wish I could really, really do it, right? Because there is hope in the good times and there is hope in the bad times. There is hope in your marriage and there is hope in the family, right? Yeah, yeah, all right, yeah. That was a terrible example of preaching. But what I'm saying is that of all the people on the planet, no matter what the election turns out to be, no matter what your marriage turns out to be, no matter what your finances turns out, and I know this is easier said than done, but no matter what goes on in the circumstances around us, we have a hope. And our hope is, our strength is renewed when we trust him, when we place our hope in him, not in this world. Not in your money, not in your retirement, not in your talent, not in your whatever. We trust in him. And Paul's saying to this guy, hey, listen, listen, man, I've heard of your love for each other. Man, I'm I'm so proud of you and your faith, your your identity's changed. And I'm so glad that you have a confident hope. And let me just tell you, that is reserved for you in heaven. Let me put on the screen like this. Being reconciled, being made whole by who Jesus is and what he has done gives us a hope that is guaranteed for us in heaven no matter what. No matter what, and this is easier said than done when it comes to your body and you're, you're battling, talking, with, I'm, I'm praying with, with somebody who just got a liver transplant, Amber, and, and, and things are gone well, but man, can I just tell you, when you're in that situation, it sometimes can be hard. Or when you're battling cancer and it's not good and it's not looking good, so easy for me to preach that, you know, to, to make, to kind of be funny and, and just say, man, you don't matter, we don't matter. But the reality is, listen, the reality is that I understand that there are some things that we go through and we walk through that are very difficult. And the most challenging thing in a difficult season of your life is to have any kind of hope. So this is not a everything's gonna turn out the way you want to kind of life or hope. This is not, oh, just picture again, first century, that when Paul dies in Rome, in the prison in Rome, when he gives his life, when Peter gives his life, when James gives his life in Jerusalem, when, when almost every disciple, all these Christians for hundreds of years, or a few hundred years, are put to the death for their faith, does this make sense what I'm saying? That, 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 that I mean, there was a hope beyond this world for them. And all I'm saying is theologically or spiritually speaking, guys, no matter what we go through, no matter what our country looks like, no matter what you like or dislike, no matter what direction your family's going or what, whatever it is, I'm not saying we don't pray about that. I'm not saying we don't go to counseling for those things. I'm not saying we don't get involved in those things. All I'm saying is that our hope is not in this world. It is not in the temporary. Our hope is, is a hope that is reserved in heaven. And that hope only comes because of the reconciliation of Jesus. Number three, or number four, we have changed lives. Um, Paul, again, going back to chapter one, verse six, I think it is verse six or five, yeah, six. This same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It is bearing, listen to this, it is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. So when, I, when, when you, we talk about what does a changed life look like? Well, there's two things that I would say that I've already mostly said, two things. Number one, forgiven, and number two, reconciled. Okay, so let's stop there. 
a changed life, spiritually speaking, for God so loved the world, gave his only son, begotten son, that whosoever would believe. When we believe, we are forgiven and we are reconciled to the Father. There is nothing added to the gospel. This next thing I'm gonna say, that is, that is not um, a conditional. So in other words, uh, um, this is the only thing that, that when I think of reconciliation, when I think of a changed life, it is I was going this direction and, and believing in my way or the world's way or another God or whatever, and now I've turned around because I have put my faith in who Jesus is and what he did. I am forgiven of my sin just as if I had never sinned, past, present, and future because you're committing sins. You committed sins yesterday that you don't even know about. Bad attitudes. Um, you know, whatever, uh, talking bad to your spouse or, you know, whatever. Okay, so, so so many things you haven't even thought of that you haven't even asked. For. So thank God for forgiveness, right? That we are forgiven, past, present, and future. And then because of that, we are reconciled to the Father. Now, as a result of these two things comes fruit, fruitful. We are fruitful. Galatians chapter five, Paul, again, writing to this about the same time as he wrote Colossians, um, he says this in chapter five. He talks about the, the flesh, and then he talks about the spirit. He talks about the fruit of the flesh, and then he talks about the fruit of the spirit. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, in other words, the fruit of your sinful nature, the results or the fruit are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, Lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so assuming, I'm assuming that that last line is the people without Jesus. People without the Lord, when, when there's no way that you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna enter into heaven because you, you're, you're living this way. For believers, when these things are the fruit, more of the fruit of your life than anything else, there is something wrong in your, in your journey. I'm not saying you're not a believer, I'm just saying that there's something that's not surrendered. There's something that is not, that's not dying. In other words, we die to ourselves. And, and so when, when these things, sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, because how many know, many of us, when we start this list, you're going, yeah, preach it, John, sexual immorality, talk more about that. But when I talk about anger, it's like, hey, 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 hey watch it. I'm just angry about what's going on in our country, and I'm just, you know, okay. Really? Does that make sense? So, so when, when, when these are more of the fruit of our life than, than, than what I'm getting ready to read, there's a surrender that needs to happen today. There, there is a dying that needs to happen today. Because this, these are fruit, or this is fruit of the flesh, of your sinful, our sinful nature. Let me read on. Galatians chapter five, same thing. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no better way. There is no better way. There is no law against these things. This is the work of God in our life. And when we bear this kind of fruit, there is something that we're continually surrendering and we're just continually dying to ourselves. Because you understand, it's not a one-time death. It's, I mean, it's a continual, man. I've got, because every once in a while, greed rises up or lust rises up or selfish ambition rises up or anger rises up. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to surrender. I've got to put that to death. And as I do, as the Holy Spirit's working in my life and the fruit of that, and, and, and by the way, Colossians 1, 6, he says, hey, this is bearing fruit all over. 
This gospel of reconciliation is bearing fruit. And when we allow the Holy Spirit to produce these kinds of things, it's a changed life. It's, it's becoming. It is a changing. It's not all at once. It is all at once. Sanctification is a one-time thing, and it's an ongoing thing. We are sanctified because of what Jesus did. That's our position. But our condition, how many know we're still screwed up? And that position is what needs to be sanctified. That position is what, uh, that condition is what needs to be surrendered and to be dead or dying. And when we do that, our life will be changed. Number five, number five, is we have love for others. So, so there is a identity, a purposeful identity. There, there is a love for each other, so important, right? There's a confident hope. There's a changed life. And then it comes full circle. We have love for others, verse seven and eight. You learned about the good news from Epaphras, our beloved coworker. He is Christ's faithful servant and he is helping us on your behalf. He has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. There's a love for each other and within the fellowship, there's a love for others. This is what, again, we've been talking about this for months and months and months. There is a love for others. If I were to put some images on the screen of certain people in our country right now, if I were to put some images of certain stars, political figures, even church figure, if I were to put them on the screen, there would, be, um, uh, there would be different emotional reactions that we would have. I'm not saying we have to agree with any of them. All I'm saying is we do, we are called to love everyone. And what we say about people that we don't even know, what we post about people that we don't even know, I'm just telling you, and this is my, I understand it's my perspective, and it may be a little bit of my personality, but I just don't, I can't get around the scriptures that say, hey, I've not only heard about your identity and, and just how you are letting Jesus change your life, your life and, and your love for each other and your confident hope, but I've also heard that you love, you love, you love others. And in Colossae, this was a, a mostly a Roman uh, Gentile area. This was not a mostly Jewish Gentile, or like Jerusalem or, or, or uh, Nazareth or the, the Sea of Galilee. This was not like that. This was a total pagan area. And, and yet you have love for the neighbors around you. Let me put on the screen like this. Reconciliation is never just about us. It's always about us sharing his love and grace with others. So when we think about um, Colossians, and this is, again, this is just chapter one. It's, it's so good. Can't wait to get to chapter three too. It, it, it just, just so many good things here. But I feel like Paul starts this whole thing. It's like, it's like a great letter to a church to say, Hey guys, let me just get some things clear. Let me make some things clear to you. That every knee will bow, I know this is Philippians, but every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. He is supreme over all. Everything bows at his name. Everything was created for him and it was created through him. And because of what he did on that cross, because of what he, what he lived and because of what he did on that cross, we have reconciliation we are reconciled to the Father. And that reconciliation brings about an identity change. It brings about a love that you have for one another. It brings about a, 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 a confident hope that we can have no matter what. The, and again, remember, they were, there, was a, there was a high level of persecution. High level of persecution or potential of that. And, and yet he's talking about hope. He's talking about, hey, no matter what your circumstances look like, there is a hope reserved for you in heaven. Don't forget that this life is a vapor. That's James, but th this is kind of the, what, 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 what he's saying. This life is not all there is. There is a hope, a confident hope, changed lives and a love for others. It's never just about us. 
That's why how we love each other, that's why how we love others is so very important. It's the only way we're gonna reach this world is when they look at our lives, they look at us, they look at our church and they go, wow, I'm so glad they're here. The traffic is a little crazy on Sunday mornings, but other than that, I am so glad they're here. So, two things. Number one, if you're a believer and there's some dying that needs to happen, there is some surrendering that needs to happen in your life, in my life. Today, I, I, I ask you to surrender that and submit that and say, God, you know what? There's some things about that, that flesh fruit that are more evident than this over here. There's some things about that over there that, man, I am, I am I'm, I'm just be honest, I'm very angry right now. And, you know, uh, uh, anger is not necessarily a sin. It's, it's, there is a, there's a anger that leads to sin. And it's okay to be worried. It's okay to be prayerful. It's okay to be concerned, but not to lose hope, guys. We're not a people who lose hope. We should be the most hope-filled people. We should be the most loving people. We should be the most stable people, the most consistent people, the most gracious people on the planet. And then people look at us, when they look at our church, when they look at your life in the neighborhood, they just go, man, they're, man, something about them. They're just, I don't know. They wouldn't say it this way, but it's a powerful life. That's Colossians 1. If you're not a believer today, I want you to know that God's not mad at you. He loves you. God so loved the world. And if you're here today and you need to surrender your life and be reconciled to the Father, Colossians 1 is for you. Paul, taught, Paul just laid it out for you. This is who Jesus is. This is what he did. And because of that, you and I can be reconciled to the Father. I've heard about your faith. I've heard about your love. I've heard about your hope. I've heard about your changed lives. I've heard about how you love them. That can happen in your life today, right now. As you surrender, no matter what campus you're on, no matter where you are watching online, that love can come into your heart. All you have to say is, Lord, I receive it. I ask you to forgive me. I ask, I'm tired, tired of my way. I surrender my identity. I surrender my will. I wanna, go, I, wanna be, I wanna be yours. So if you're a believer, you need to surrender and die today. If you're not a believer, you need to surrender and die today. And when you do, you pick up a life and a purpose that is so much better than anything you could have imagined for your life. I pray that for you. Let's pray. God, your word it, it, it really does change our life. It, it's a light, it's a lamp, it's a sword. God, help us to respond today. Help me, help me to respond today. May we surrender our will, our anger, our impurity, our jealousy, May, may we surrender our lives to allow your kingdom to come and your will be done right here in my life, in our lives as it is in heaven. And may we reach this world because of our love, our grace, and our powerful lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.